sort of half works. All right. Yeah, Rob is sick, unfortunately, uh, so he couldn't make it. I put some slides together a bit last minute here, and uh, we'll talk about how someone else will solve your scaling problem for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I could not agree more with Adrian. We, it's everyone's problem. You shouldn't just be sitting back and waiting for someone else to do something. Like We have a lot of companies who now have a lot of money and a lot of uh, stuff at stake and basically can't launch their apps because Ethereum is not good enough and uh, I, I cannot um, agree with that more that like it's it's everyone's sort of um, Responsibility to build toward this common good of trying to make this thing work uh, This talk is sort of a progress updates. Uh, so I just got back from Taiwan yesterday both me and Rob of uh, it was a workshop between client implementers and Ethereum research and uh, sort of all the people involved in trying to define what a scaling solution is for Ethereum. Um, and so uh, before we dig in, I, I, I kind of recap a little bit of uh, what Adrian was saying as well, but um, there's a lot of discussion around what scaling actually is and uh, what it should be. Um, the first one that's been talked a lot about over the past couple of years is Raiden and Lightning. Um, and what's important to know here is sort of that it's uh, almost like a point-to-point -point system. If I, if like Alice wants to send a transaction to Bob, they open a state channel with each other. They can transact however much they want off-chain and then, then like settle their um, final balances to the chain. Um, there's various ways to make this point-to-point -point system a little bit more distributed, but it, it is in essence that. So you could send a transaction through a third party, uh, but it's still sort of point-to-point -point between all these different um, players. Plasma and Plasma Cash uh, is sort of aiming to be a general off-chain uh, aggregation um, method, and uh, you check out the latest podcast where I talked to Carl Floss and Phil Dion on this topic and we dig into everything with the security model and what Floss it has. Um, you're really like, you don't have data availability, like Adrian was saying, if everyone wants to exit, it's a problem. Um, it has its applications, but it's not a general scaling solution either. What Ethereum and the Ethereum Foundation, Ethereum researchers and, and client implementers are trying to build is this sort of real um, layer one scaling solution. And I'll talk a little bit here about what that uh, entails. So we have Ethereum. The naive way to scale it is to make it bigger, right? <laughs> uh, this means larger block sizes. It means uh, larger state, larger history. Uh, it's essentially something that we can't keep doing. We can't keep, keep up with it. It's not realistic. So uh, the naive approach, uh, well, the less naive no, no, approach, but what we've seen in the past is sort of you fork a chain, you create a new chain, you do a bunch of transactions on there, um, and so essentially you start up all these other chains and then try to somehow swap tokens in between them and with bridges or atomic swaps or whatever. And uh, the problem here is that you're splitting up security. Like, if you started up five Ethereums, you would have five times the scale, but how do you do this without splitting up security? So I'm trying to illustrate that here by basically this chain has six miners, and so this is secured by those miners, but um, really we've split our entire security pool across these five different chains, so we now have one-fifth the security on each chain, and this is obviously not acceptable. So the question is, can we build a system in which we have five chains, but they're all secured by the same pool of security? And the answer is yes, we can have that. That's what's being planned and what's being built. Uh, in this system, uh, you go from having miners to having it, um, proposers, collators, and executors. What's important to note here is that this all assumes a proof of stake system. This cannot work on a proof of work system. So you have to have proof of stake. You have to have uh, the ability to slash someone's um, tokens um, for basically crypto economic security. 
So I'll, I'll dig into a little bit what phase one is, um, but it's uh, if you actually want to read all the details, there's a great uh, post on the three search forum. Uh, I made a little uh, tiny link to this as well. So you can just go to tiny.cc slash sharding and it'll get you to this forum post. Uh, it digs into kind of everything and how phase one is supposed to play out. But essentially, um, phase one is intended uh, to like literally be useless. <laughs> but it's a proof of concept of the proposer and collator structure. So uh, there will be 100 shards in the first version of this, which means that we have 100 times the uh, scalability, the transaction throughput. And um, there will be no cross shard communication. So each of these chains can uh, propagate data up to the main chain but they can't talk to each other. And that's a, that comes in a later phase. Um, so we have this proposer, collator, executor structure. In phase one, there will be no executor. So the proposers propose completely random data. Like it's just some random data to be able to agree on. The collators take this random data by the proposers and they commit that to an on-chain contract. So there's this sharding, shard manager contract that the Ethereum Foundation is writing that will be deployed to the main chain. And then we have these two different uh, players uh, in this game where, um, so the, it's the proposers and the collators. And the collators collectively secure all of the chains. So it's the same collator pool and these collators stake some amount of ether to become a collator. It's free to be a proposer, so anyone can be a proposer. Essentially what the proposer does is uh, says, here's a block of transactions uh, that I propose to you collators to include on the main chain. And um, the collators are pick, free to pick whatever proposal they want and they sign off on it and um, sort of commit the Merkle tree root of that uh, collation to the main chain. And then sort of that's how uh, this shard progresses um, and every collation that is committed, we get one step further along the shard chain. Uh, the initial proposal I think is to have um, every, um, have a collation every five or seven blocks or something on the main chain. So we're not like overloading the main chain with these collation transactions. The main chain is completely unchanged from a protocol pr perspective in this scenario. Uh, it's only this on-chain smart contract that manages the collations. Uh, there's no cross-chain communication, no executor. So it's a very simple system. This is something that um, we talked about like roadmap and everyone is kind of starting to work on this now and should be done you know, in three to six months, something like that. Uh, it's, it's a pretty easy thing uh, compared to the full system, which t will take several years to build. Phase two, um, I've sort of copy pasted this from the forum post. Uh, it's um, full nodes only, so there's a separate conversation um, that I'll go into a little bit about like what different types of nodes we can support in this system. So the overall goal obviously in this is to um, increase throughput without increasing the amount of resources necessary to secure this or to run a node on this. Uh, so you should really only ever be responsible for running only the main chain or only one shard. Uh, there, are, there is a concept like a super full node that runs all the shards and the main chain. But those would you know, require um, an, uh, like n squared amount of resources compared to how many shards you have. Um, and it's just not reasonable that normal people should do, do that. So the goal here is still that you can run a client for the shard that you're on on your phone. Like that's, that's the ideal, that's what the ideal have been for Ethereum always and, and will continue to be. So um, we, in phase two, there will be cross-shard communication. Um, it says cross-contract here, but, uh, but it will be asynchronous. So essentially, um, there's some idea or some plans to make the EVM asynchronous as well. So you have like a callback model 
which means that you can send a message to a shard and then wait for that shard to, like a block on that shard to be mined and then a transaction goes back, calls uh, a function on your original shard and that's sort of how communication will happen. And this is a bit of a problem. So um, there's this problem uh, called the train and hotel problem, uh, which is, that is, is essentially that I want to book a train and a hotel but they're from different service providers. So if these two different service pro providers live on two different shards, uh, I need some way to like say that I booked a hotel here, and only if this booking is successful do I want to book the train over here. Uh, and with only asynchronous calls, uh, it's not necessarily possible. Account abstraction, I don't necessarily have to dig into all that much. Uh, a notable point is that eWASM is the target uh, VM for shards. So it seems at this point that it'll be unlikely that um, eWASM will ever exist on the main chain. And if you want to run WASM contracts, you have to run it on a shard somewhere. So the shards will all be homogenous. They'll all run the same VM um, and look the exact same way and will probably run WASM. And this is sort of the reason we're not talking about this at all until phase two is because we're not proposing any transactions or anything. We're just proposing random data in phase one. So uh, in phase two is when we introduce a VM and propose actual transactions that are run on that VM. Uh, accumulators is a whole thing. That was like a whole day of the workshop to talk about uh, various accumulators. But so like a Merkle tree is a type of accumulator that lets you prove something about the data that you've accumulated into like a hash. Um, storage rent is another thing that will probably be necessary. Uh, I don't know if it's necessary for phase two, but um, I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit as well in a, in a bit. So the, the rest, all these different phases, <laughs> is very much unplanned like or unmapped out. Uh, all of these contain areas of very active research uh, with lots of unanswered questions. Stateless clients is essentially a type of structure where instead of every node maintaining a full copy of the state database, uh, you just maintain a copy of like the data that you own or that you're interested in. And then when you make a transaction, you um, submit that transaction along with a witness of the Merkle tree uh, that lets you prove that, yes, I, this is like a valid transaction. And then you know, miners can include these transactions into a block because they've seen the witness of it. And, uh, no one has to manage state really. But then, then you have huge questions of data availability and, and a bunch of other problems that are sort of unsolved. Phase four is cross shard transactions, which is uh, uh, like to solve the, the um, train and hotel problem, you need like internally synchronous zones within these shards so that you can actually like in a synchronous atomic fashion do transactions across shards. Um, phase five uh, is sort of working out all of these data availability proofs, the Casper integration, um, fork-free sharding is a very kind of controversial topic. Vlad thinks that there should be forkful shards, and I don't know, it's very <laughs> not undefined. Um, and the question here, uh, like, there's another like layer of abstraction that we could introduce here. Um, like having a manager shard, so essentially replacing the main chain with a shard uh, so that we can have like recursive sharding and it's not locked in to be 100 shards or anything. So basically you have a manager, manager shard that has 100 shards and then that one can report up to the main chain so you can have like, uh, yeah, super quadratic sharding which is phase six and then the question is, how do you do load balancing between these? If I have a, if I deploy a contract to a shard, it becomes super popular. Maybe I need to move that to another shard, or other contracts on that shard need to move to not be bogged down by that super popular contract. Um, and yeah, like providing a developer abstraction on top of all of this is super important as well. So, in a load balancing model, you really don't want developers to have to care where their contract is deployed, like on which shard. And that sort of goes into the account abstraction bits as well. 
And uh, I will take questions before I dig into this stuff, I think, because they're, they're interesting topics that we all talked about and uh, kind of covered at this workshop as well, but they're semi-unrelated to, to sharding. Any questions? Yeah, so there's, uh, there was a couple of different models proposed on how a shard is picked. Uh, it could be that, yeah, there, there's a fixed number, so, you know, take your enode ID modulo 100 and that's what your shard becomes or your address modulo 100 something. And uh, uh, that's one model. Another is uh, you actually get to choose yourself because you may actually have knowledge about, like, I my contract will need to talk to this one or, um, like this shard is less busy than that one, and so I want to be there. Um, gas prices and gas price markets will be a thing in this model because gas prices may be cheaper in one shard than another. Uh, so then how do you actually work out where to deploy stuff? That's part of the load balancing question as well. Initially, it'll either, either be that you just pick it or that um, the... Um, um, the you know ID or your address picks it for you. Um, I think what's important to note as well, and I didn't really cover, was that the collators, there's a pool of collators that secure all the shards. And you have an, an honest majority assumption on these collators, and you pick like 400 or 100, uh, some number of them, uh, randomly to be collators for any particular shard, and you swap this often, exactly how often is undefined. Uh, but then you have like a statistical significance, um, or like a statistical property that your shard is secure under um, like two thirds majority if the honest majority assumption holds for all the collators. You could, yes. Um, it sort of depends a little bit on the how do you pick a shard and what the um, um, yeah what the model is there. But there's really no reason that you couldn't add shards. Um, but probably what's more likely is that we'll run with a hundred until like super quadratic sharding or like the the whole manager shard thing is introduced so that you basically add, when you run out of space, you add another manager shard and get another 100. What would be the point in which you actually decide to add shards? You don't like what the threshold? That would have to be left up to like a governance structure that is undefined. <laughs> Yeah, no, randomness actually would probably work quite well to distribute the load across the shards. Um, especially, I mean, to be honest, we don't actually have that much deployed on Ethereum. <laughs> there's not that much running, uh, it, and because there's not that much that can run. Uh, so once we get like 100 shards, we have a 100-fold increase in capacity, and we'll, like, we're pretty good for a while. Um, so really, it feels unlikely that we'll need any really advanced load balancing mechanism for a long time. Uh, would it be possible to split one contract across shards? No, that's not part of the model at all. Uh, so the word is basically if you have a very popular contract that would saturate the transaction throughput of one shard, you need to find a way to split that contract up yourself. So you might have one contract that does user management on one shard and another that does you know, Twitter postings on another shard. <laughs> 
and then you would have to rely on cross shard communication to actually like make all this work. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty complex question of how do you do that and how do, how do you make the UX of that good? Uh, quite a lot. Um, in a synchronous sort of zone con construct, um, you don't necessarily, like you'd have a two block latency, I guess. But in the asynchronous model, you could ha like your worst case is actually quite bad. Like uh, you'd have to wait for a number of collations and then get synced back to the main chain and then all that has to go back out to the shard and so it's actually quite a lot of blocks that might have to go to pass in between. Uh, since this is um, proof of stake, you would have transaction final finality. Like it would all be instant finality stuff, uh, basically. And um, the reason, like I don't really understand the reason Vlad doesn't like fork freeness. Um, but in his, so Vlad has his own uh, model for sharding, uh, unexpectedly. <laughs> um, sort of binary sharding structure where you use merge blocks instead of um, reporting anything to a main chain. So you have like one chain or like two chains at the top that have merge blocks that they talk between and then there's like, so imagine a binary tree and at each level you have merge blocks so you can kind of merge up to one chain. Uh, in that model you, you could actually run each of those chains on proof of work or something else uh, and you just need to make sure that these merge blocks happen in some way. Um, and in that system you have completely different, like you, you kind of get uh, cross shard communication out of the box uh, but you have completely different latency expectations in how you traverse this tree with various transactions. Um, and yeah, so flarding is uh, is a thing in its <laughs> early stages. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, the assumption of this model of sharding is that it is proof sake. Um, I, yeah, otherwise, like you were saying, like there's no real guarantee to provide fork freeness otherwise. Um, yeah. And if so, yeah, it's a whole thing of like you could, under certain security assumptions, allow both forks and reorgs and everything like that. Uh, but uh, reorgs can actually lead to a situation where you need to have cascading reorgs. So if one uh, chain reorgs, then you need to like reorg everything else and it becomes a nightmare and naturally might break networking assumptions and everything else. I'll, uh, I only have five minutes left, but I want to talk about storage rent. So storage rent was, was a big thing. Uh, also on the latest po podcast is uh, Phil Dyan and, and he talks a little bit about storage rent. This is sort of his uh, thing that he's talking about now and I think it's a super important thing to highlight. Um, there is a misaligned incentive right now in Ethereum between miners and full nodes. So when you deploy something or when you use storage on the chain, you pay a fixed fee once to put that storage there. And the miner is the one that gets this fee, but the miner is only one player in this market that actually um, pays the cost of this storage. Every other full node in the network also pays the cost of this storage and they get nothing for it. So there's a very misaligned incentive here. The miners don't even necessarily have to care about storage. Um, they only need the latest block, so they could technically not pay the cost even and still get the, get the reward for it. Um, furthermore, it's obviously unsustainable to have the chain keep growing forever. So we need to fix that somehow. And uh, storage rent is the proposed solution where instead of paying a fixed fee for storage, you pay a you know, price per unit of time for storage. 
So essentially, anything that you deploy to the chain would have uh, time to live, a TTL. And depending on what this TTL is, uh, like you may choose to use the contract or not. Um, and like if you see an app and it has a one week TTL, you probably wouldn't trust that app. Whereas if you see it has a hundred years TTL, then you like feel free to use it. Um, the biggest question around all of this is what's a good UX and how do we actually migrate people from having had free storage, essentially free storage forever, to having to pay for it. And um, there's a, a bunch of other questions like, by when, when we talk about storage rent and what happens when you run out of rent is that it gets removed from state, but it doesn't get removed from history. So now you kind of talk and you're, you're in a world where you're explicitly separating state and history um, history being like all the block bodies and all the actual blocks in the chain. So in that model, you could actually say pay to resurrect a contract, bring it back into states. It would cost the node operators some amount of money to like go through the history to find that data and bring it back. Um, but if you start separating this thing, like do you then have to pay rent for history as well? There's a lot of talk about like history is also unsustainable to keep around forever. So when do we start talking about actually deleting history? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a very complex topic, but it's something that I feel everyone should start thinking about now so that we have a good answer in like five years when it becomes uh, unsustainable with the current model. <laughs> Any questions on, uh, on that stuff or, or anything else? All right, and thank you very much.